just got a call from my daughter wishing me a happy Father's Day. It was her bedtime, getting ready to go to bed. So timing, well, you know, I'm glad she's doing well. Um, what what uh, children are dismissed under which third grade and under? All right. So have fun, guys. Be good. Love Jesus. But uh, bless the teachers. <clears throat> well, it's a privilege to... Uh, be here today and be able to speak and preach today. Excited about that. My prayer is that each of us is renewed and drawn closer to Jesus, that our hearts will be turned as the Lord fills us with his love, will be turned outward towards others, and that we'll love every person that we ever lost eyes with. Truly, Jesus died and rose again so that none shall perish, not even one. And uh, may each of us have the privilege and honor to partner with the Holy Spirit to depopulate hell and to, to bring uh, believers and, and friends uh, with us into heaven. That's my prayer today. I'm a bit uh, pumped up and psyched, uh, uh, Bear and Rob and myself and uh, several others. Uh, volunteers went into Hazleton on Thursday for eight hours, and uh, um, God was doing amazing work. It was, it was powerful. Uh, please remember Matthew, one of um, most of the institution was on lockdown, so we only had part of them. They were coming staggered throughout the day, but one of, uh, one of the uh, participants, Matthew, he said, I, I, I kind of felt bad to say but um, when we were here before, but I, I don't know if I consider myself a Christian. I, I'm, I, uh, I started worshiping Odin and Thor and Scandinavian you know, gods, and so we had a lot of discussion around our table and apologetics and the rest, and so I love Matthew and uh, pray for him that uh, the light breaks through and uh, uh, true vision is restored there. Well, um, I felt like I, I, I got a green light from the Lord spiritually. I felt like this was the first time, you know, to give one of my Kairos talks um, that uh, we give on our four-day weekends. But uh, Amy heard one of the stories uh, at the end, and she said, I've heard that before. And so I looked back, and uh, Tim Perkins, one of our Kairos uh, um, graduates, as we call them, attended this church, and he gave his testimony, and I shared part of this uh, message at that time. And so count this as a review if you were here nine years ago and, and have a better memory than me. And so, uh, but... Very excited. This is the, the ninth of ten talks that we do throughout the weekend, the four-day weekend that we're uh, there uh, in, uh, in, the, in the prison here or down in Elkin. And so um, each of the talks build on one another, and so this is towards the end. So this kind of uh, encapsulates what we've uh, shared throughout the weekend and, and kind of sends them off uh, on their way and... and uh, uh, guys, I've been in dozens of, of ministries throughout the years, and there is nothing like it. I, I, to see men, you know, we give them the opportunity to give testimony, and they stand, and literally, they're testifying to Christ and his forgiveness, and, and, and then going where Jesus is going to take them, and I literally seeing them transform as they're giving their testimony, they're giving their life to Christ, and they didn't even know it. I mean, it's just beautiful in seeing their lives uh, transformed, and I count it such a privilege to be able to be up uh, here at Hazleton. That's the only the fourth federal penitentiary in all of uh, the U.S. that has allowed Kairos in, and so what a, what a beautiful uh, thing. Uh, the motto is listen, listen, Love, love. And I had to practice that when, when Matthew was sharing. Okay, I'm listening. Okay, I'm listening. And, and then I'm going to wait for a good opportunity to, to, uh, to lift up Christ. And so, and, and God honored that. Um, one of the, the stories that I remember most is uh, um, uh, when we were in Huttonsville, uh, John was in our table group and he said, Pastor Sean, can I talk to you privately? And, and we had a spot where... where um, Participants could pull a pastor aside, and he said, I just, I mean, he, he just broke down, and he's just weeping. He said, he said, how can God forgive me? I killed a man in a bar fight. He would never go back to his family. 
her, her mom and dad could never see him. And, and, and I, I, you know, I didn't know what to say. And, and the Holy Spirit, like a lightning bolt, opened up the Apostle Paul's life to me. Paul said, I am the worst of sinners. I was a wretched man. I persecuted Christians. I killed Christians. That's why I forget. I count my previous life dung. <laughs> There's a worse word for that. I count it as dung compared to Christ and what he's doing inside of me and the, and the future hope of glory. And I was able to share. I said, if God could forgive Paul, who said he was the worst of sinners, how much more could he redeem your life? And literally, he, Saul turned into Paul, wrote a good portion of the New Testament. And uh, what a... It is incredible. There is no place too dark, too far away, too too uh, too great of rebellion, uh, too uh, um, heinous of a crime that God's grace can't redeem and forgive. Um, uh, you guys have seen this, but it sets it up so well. We're going to uh, listen to uh, Tommy Fisher's testimony. It's only two minutes and fifty seconds or so. Let's go ahead and play that, and then we'll, we'll get into it. Tommy Fisher. I was born and raised in Los Angeles, California. I grew up in the street gangs there. I got a lot of trouble. I ended up doing 20 years, 11 months flat in prison. I had an aggravated life sentence. I wasn't supposed to never get out. I ran the gangs in prison. You know, and I heard a lot of men for some crazy reasons. I used to actually get Christians beat up because they said they wanted to come to Christ. That's how crazy and radical I was. But when they pick Kairos, they only pick the worst inmates on the unit because they want the roughest dudes on the unit, the fools, to get changed. And this ministry is actually going in here and showing this love and changing people like that. I'm going to tell you the truth. I went for their food. I didn't go to get saved, but God had set me up. When I was sitting there, man, you know, I was listening to this dude talk. You know when Paul was on the road to Damascus and Jesus, just Jesus' presence knocked him off that horse? I know for a fact I felt the presence of the Holy Spirit. I felt it like Paul felt it. And from that day forth, you know, God has just been blessing my life. While I was in that prison, I got into this third part theological seminary and Bible Institute. I got a bachelor's degree in biblical studies. I also went to college and I got me an LBT. I just thank God for God bless me. I got a license to counsel. And I really thank God for what he changed me into because I used to be a monster. I used to really be a monster. The only reason why I don't know if I ever killed a man because I never went back and asked the man who I shot was he dead. But I shot a lot of people and I hurt a lot of people's lives. But ministries like Kairos can go inside the walls and show a man it's God's love. Man, if I could tell anybody, anybody about Kairos, man, it's changing lives. I got to give God back what he gave me. He gave me back my life. He gave me them years at the local store for me. He gave them back to me. <laughs> and I'm thankful for that. Well, this isn't a recruiting <laughs> time, but if the Lord would ever lay it on your heart to go in with the men, um, we need more. We need more uh, volunteers. If uh, to pray, to enter, to be one of the intercessors, to give, uh, to bake cookies when we go back into Huttonsville, um, and we would also love to start up a women's ministry uh, there at Hazelton as well. We need a, a steering team to <clears throat> kind of take that on and pray that through because the chaplain's ready. He said, "Just you bring me the people, and we'll make it happen." And so. Um, Spread that news far and wide. And, uh, yeah. <clears throat> so we have these posters. This is the first slide. And we put our name and, and the rest, and I'll, I'll get into it. 
But I'm Sean Whiteman. I'm a clergy from Morgantown. The name of this talk is Walking in God's Grace, or could very easily be called Walking Your Talk. This talk is about putting your faith into actions. It's about walking your talk by God's grace. In the obstacles to accepting God's grace talk, we were reminded of the struggles that you'll encounter in this compound after we leave. You also heard that the choice to be obedient to the call of Christ is not an easy one, but it is the best one. God gives all of us the freedom to make our own choice. In Kairos, we believe the decision to follow Christ is the best total solution for you and for everyone else. It also seems most of you guys have had a pretty good time this weekend. I know that we as volunteers have as well. But today the weekend will end, and all of us will return to our respective worlds, some to the compound and some to the free world. Brothers, I want to share with you that you're not the first or the only one to have ever had to face the reality of getting back into the world and its challenges. I don't know if you remember Jesus, uh, took three of the disciples up to the Mount of Transfiguration, Peter, James, and John, and uh, a bright light shone, and, and, and God's word, this is my son, and uh, Moses and Elijah were there, and, and Peter, not knowing what to say, let's make three shelters. And uh, Jesus says, no, we have to go back down the mountain, down into the mud and the muck. But guess what? Where the mud and the muck is, that is the most fertile place to grow. Just think about that for a moment. This mountaintop experience prepares you for valley duty. I know that I always grow more spiritually during the hard and trying times. That's when I'm most desperate and desperate relying on God. I love it. The best and the sweetest fruit grows in the valley. It was when my brother took his life on the same day we lost our first pregnancy. That was when I grew most spiritually. I was desperate and desperately relying on God. Every morning I woke up with that pit in my stomach. I would have to run to the, my Heavenly Father to fill it. Each night I cried out to God to fill that empty spot. Pretty soon those prayers turned outward to others to the lost at WVU where I was ministering, to other ministries for people to come to Christ in every nation, for missionaries. I didn't want anyone to leave this world without Christ. What an awful thought. When he poured out his love on our campus ministry, we saw some 150 people come to Christ over that next year and a half. Guys, it's important to know that we are human beings and we're subject to all the temptations that being human brings with us. That's why we pray, Lord, lead us not in temptation. We'll never obtain perfection this side of seeing Jesus face to face, but with the power of God and the Holy Spirit, we can have a long obedience in the same direction till we see him. One of the first important steps in this walk with God is to make amends for past wrongs that we have done without putting others or ourselves in potential injury. By admitting our mistakes, asking for forgiveness from those that we hurt, we can accept that relationship that God offers to us, that free gift of grace. 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us of our sins. Guys, in high school, I worked at a little bit of junior high and a little bit of college as well, worked at Mountain Lakes Campground. Sometimes I was the night guard, and at the end of those late night shifts, I stole candy bars and ice cream and didn't pay for them. I guess I thought I deserved it, and I was hungry. But a few years later, when I rededicated my life back to the Lord, he convicted me to go back and to confess and to pay um, for what I had done, and boy, I fought him. Couldn't hardly sleep at night until I obeyed, and uh, I went back and, and paid back what I owed and asked for forgiveness, and the Lord also brought to mind all the things that I had said to my mom through those rough years as well. I guess I 
thought I knew everything. And, uh, and guys, forgiveness and peace are the best pillow that you'll ever have. And God wipes away shame and guilt. Amen. So let's focus on some tools that can help us maintain this life favored by God. And we've mentioned it through the weekend, this stool, this three-legged stool, not a stool yet, but on the weekend it is, um, is a friendship with God's stool. The top of this stool is what we can stand and we can sit on. It's friendship with God. He offers this gift. And uh, um, the first leg is spirituality. And spirituality is, is the first leg. You can't sit yet, but we're getting there. And this represents an unbroken friendship with God. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, um, spirituality is a personal journey that we have with God to become more Christ-like. As we mentioned, we'll never become perfect as Christ, but we can be more spirit-filled, more spirit-led people. And when we spend time with God, the fruits of the Spirit show up in our life. Love, joy, peace, patience, goodness, kindness, gentleness, self-control. And man, give me double. We, each of us need that. But when we talk about loving God and loving others, what does that mean? Many of us have had um, tough family backgrounds and experiences where love was used to manipulate and if you do this for me, then I'll love you. Well, that's not the love of Christ. That's not the love that we're talking about here. The love of Christ, agape love, is we want the best for others. We want, uh, that doesn't mean the best Rolexes or the best cars, but the best spiritually and, uh, and caring for others. And that, that God would have the highest potential in others. Well, what are some of the practical ways that we can do that and grow this spirituality, this personal holiness? Um, you'll see those on, on the poster, on the slide. Daily prayer, daily devotion to God, absolutely essential. Like David, we can have a spirit of self-examination. Search me, O oh God, know me. Know what is going on inside of me and show that to me. The third is being in community with other Christians, so important. We'll talk more about that here in a sec. Going to chapel services, singing and worshiping. The scriptures tell us not to forsake the assembly of the believer. And so we're called uh, to be in fellowship in church uh, with, uh, with others. And of course, reading uh, the Bible. When we pray and meditate on God's word, we're having daily conversation. That's a two-way conversation. Um, God gave us two ears and one mouth. We're, 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 we're supposed to listen. Um, and and uh, when we pray, speak those things to God, then we're supposed to listen and uh, um, for what God will tell us. And how important is communication being in a relationship? Just like uh, if when Amy and I were married 28 years ago, I could have said to Amy, what a great engagement and a great wedding. Let's talk once a week. That relationship's going to end within probably a week. And uh, our relationship with God is no different. He longs for relationship and connection and fellowship with him. He reveals himself to us. And guys, I, I've been a Christian since I been, was four years old. And at a men's retreat, even this past November, Jesus wrecked me. He said, Sean, your priorities are wrong. Do you love me more than these things? Yes, Amy. Sean, I love you. I cherish you. I adore you. But will you flip the script? Will you stop watching so much TV at night and go to bed and get up with me early in the morning so I can pour my love into you and I can show you what the day? And, and, and guys, um, we can't fathom the depth of intimacy that it's it's more it's more it's more than and even in eternity I think we'll be getting closer and closer and closer uh, to him and he calls us into those intimate spots. Well, the second leg, the first leg was spirituality. Wow, wow. The second leg is discovery through study. So the second leg is is study. We're not there yet. We're getting there, but. Uh, 
study is the gateway to understanding what it means to live the Christian life. Just like a microscope, if you take a drop of water from a river or from a pond, you're going to see it teeming with life. And when you examine the scripture, you're going to find gold and silver and nuggets in there that you'd never thought were there. And the Holy Spirit is going to reveal new insights to you. And then you get to share that with others. And so this is this leg of, of study. Tim, one of our Kairos uh, uh, graduates, uh, um, uh, attended this church uh, for quite a few years. And, and he had went through Kairos weekend, and then he went to the chapel service, and he went through a similar talk like this, and he said, I need to work on my study. And uh, he went to the chaplain, and the chaplain said, here's a K. Arthur precepts ministry verse-by-verse -verse study, and uh, told him what it was going to be about and how, you know, um, it's, it's a pretty in-depth study. And so he walked out of the chaplain's office and, and was heading back to his cell, and he slipped on the floor and hit the door frame of his cell. And guys, there is no harder frame in this world than, than prison door frame. And it rung his bell. And he heard in his spirit, you said you wanted to study. Well, here's the meat and potatoes, pick up and eat. And so ever since that, that day, he's at least an hour and a half or two every day in the Word, and he's still growing in the Lord. So that's, uh, that's study. Um, uh, I think that's the next slide. Uh, how do we study? Of course, it's reading, reading the Bible. John Wesley said he was a man of one book. It doesn't translate too well. He said, I'm a Bible bigot. He said, I'm a man of one book. And yet, John Wesley was the, one of the most read of any of the reformers uh, in, in church history. Um, but he was a man of one book. Billy Graham had a similar experience to that. When, when he was fighting doubt, he set his Bible on the, on the it was in the woods, and he set it on that um, stump, and he said, either I'll stand on that or I won't. And, and so it changed his life. Um, we are to be about the Bible. Um, Pastor Nate's mom um, many times would say, if you're not reading the word, you're going to be wilting on the vine, you're going to be dying. So that's life, it's sustenance. And so um, not only that, attend the chapel services, uh, get involved in like the precept ministry that I just mentioned with Kay Arthur. Ask the chaplain, you know, maybe to get your Bible uh, on tape if, if you have trouble reading or have another um, uh, uh, Sally um, uh, read to you as well. There's great authors as well, Henry Nowen or Max Licato or Rick Warren, T.G. B. Jakes, um, other well-known authors, uh, very important. All right, next. So what's the first two? Spirituality, study. I didn't get that one in all the way. The third is Christian action. Um, we're called, and look at this, it, it sets. It, we can, I can stand on it. I probably shouldn't stand on both of those, but look at this and do that. And, uh, um, and this is our fellowship with God God's tool, and we can, uh, we can put our weight down on it. And so this Christian action is so important. Christian action is done out of unselfish love. You don't perform Christian action just because you're a nice person. Even non-Christians do that. But out of the love of God that he has put in your heart, you share with others. It is so important. Uh, even as I've um, listened to podcasts and different things like that, uh, not that this is the reason that we do it, but the best way out of stress and strain and depression and the doldrums is to serve others. And it, and it makes sense. Jesus said it's better to give than to receive. And when we give, it gets our eyes off of ourselves. Um, in, and we get to bless others. And that love of God from above works its way in and through us so that we can love others. And so Christian action is so, so important. So the first part of that, uh, 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 some points here, is we need to live in Christian community. God is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, three in one. He is a perfect uh, community, and he's made us in his image. And so we die on the vine if we're not in Christian community. And so there is no Lone Ranger Christian. We, uh, we need each other. Even when we've got the Holy Joes or the Pious Peets or the Gossip Sues, you know, um, uh, we're, we're all human, um, and, but yet we're called 
to fellowship with one another. Next is be an encouraging and positive person. Every day you have an opportunity to reach out into love with others, bringing God's love to them, building them up and affirming them. Avoid criticism and judgmentalism. That just drives people away. And uh, The next uh, here is we must avoid cheap grace. There are some who may take Christ's message and turn it into something it was never meant to be. They may say, oh, I can go and do anything I want now that I'm forgiven. God's grace covers it. Paul, the apostle, said, God forbid, may it never be so. Who would even think such a thing? Um, but when we do, when we take advantage of that grace, um, uh, we call that cheap grace, it is free, grace is free, but it came at a great price. It cost Jesus his life. And it's going to be costly here in this environment as well, as we follow Jesus as well. Next, struggle to hold on to your faith. You know, next week, maybe um, someone say, oh, you went to that Christian thing. Why, you know, you say you're a Christian now. Well, what about that that you just did? What about you just watch this? And, and uh, you can remember this three-legged stool. Okay, friendship with God. How am I doing? on each of these legs. And so um, you can remember that. And it's not just you holding on to God, it's God holding on to you. The end of chapter 8 of Romans says, nothing can separate us from the love of God. Whatever happened in the past, whatever happens in the future, what happens today, nothing can separate us from the love of God. Even angels or demons can separate us from his love. And so God wants the very best for you and for his creation. And so Christian action is the way that we share that with others and we get closer to Christ. Because in Christ we say, make a friend, be a friend, bring a friend to Christ. Would you guys say that with me? Make a friend, be a friend, bring a friend to Christ. And guys, as I close, some of you guys still might be struggling accepting God's love. Can he really forgive me? Can he really change my life and redeem me? Well, I've got two stories of two small boys. Uh, the first one is me at six years old. My brother's Cub Scout troop hiked down the Golly River to see the Whitewater River rafters navigate a Class 5 uh, rapids at Silver Rock. Very dangerous even in a boat. Well, I stepped on a slick rock and got swept in. The boys yelled, and my mom asked if the main scout leader could swim, and he said, no, not at all. So my mom, without ever thinking of her own safety or what the family would say, she jumped in uh, to that river and rescued me, somehow got in front of me, kept my head above water. Somehow we got to the other side, and two kayakers showed up, got us to the other side, and I think they might have been angels because we turned around to thank them, and they weren't there. And... Uh, and so we made our way back to the rest of the troop and started heading up the mountain. And uh, during that time, two of the boys, even without any shoes on, had ran all the way back up the mountain, got a pay phone and called 911. And uh, when we got halfway up the mountain, two paramedics with stretchers were coming down, and they were in shock and awe. Um, they really thought they would be picking us up eight miles down river at the next river access. And uh, the next story is also of a little boy on a hot summer day in Florida. The young boy decided to go for a swim in a pond near his home. His mom would always tell him not to go to the pond without carefully looking around and making sure that she knew that he was going into the water. On this particular scorcher of a day, in a hurry to dive into the cool water, he, he dashed out the back door, leaving behind shoes, socks, and shirt. He swam towards the middle of the pond, not realizing that an alligator was swimming towards him. His mother in the house, gazing out the window, her mouth dropped in horror as she saw the alligator and realized that the two were swimming towards each other. In stark terror, she ran towards the water, screaming to her son as loudly as she could. Hearing her cries, the little boy became alarmed and made a U-turn and began to swim frantically back towards his mother. It was too late. Just as he reached her, the alligator reached him. From the dock, the mother grabbed her baby boy's arms just as the alligator snatched his legs. 
that began an incredible tug of war between the mother and the alligator. The alligator struggled and strained, but no way was the mother going to let go. A farmer happened to pass by, raced from his truck with a gun, took aim, and shot and killed the alligator. Remarkably, after weeks and weeks in the hospital, the little boy survived. His legs were extremely scarred and disfigured by the vicious attack of the alligator. But on his arms were deep gouges where his mother's fingernails had dug into his flesh in her effort to hang on to her son. The newspaper reporter who interviewed the boy asked if he would show him his scars. The boy raised his pant legs, and then with obvious pride, he said to the reporter, but look at my arms. I have, I have great scars on my arms, too. I have them because my mom would not let go. Brothers, no matter where you go, no matter what you do, no matter what you've done, God will not let you go. He understands. He was abused. He was mocked. He was betrayed. He was whipped, stripped, strip searched, incarcerated for you and for me. The love of God that Jesus brought to this world comes to us. He would not let you go. Jesus' scars are still in his physical body today, sitting at the right hand of the Father, praying for you and me, even as I speak. This is how much love he has for you and me. One more story. As I close this past Kairos uh, uh, last year, um, the third day we have a forgiveness talk at the end of the day, and so throughout the day we have the men write down people they need to forgive. Uh, one of them is themselves, and things they need to, to release back to God. It's a powerful, powerful uh, building of that day, and so uh, they write their uh, list, and we share with them, you know, that even though their sins are as scarlet, God can make them white as snow. He can remove your sin as far as the east is from the west. And then we stand as family table group, huddled around our burn bucket, and we place each of those uh, lists in the bucket, and we pray. And then the chaplain took out uh, with one of our volunteers, went outside of the where the chapel services are in this 60-yard by 60-yard. I, I, I walked it off uh, on Thursday. And uh, um, and when he started to light those lists, there was a spot in heaven that opened up, and there was a gentle rain that fell just in that spot. And the guys, did you see that? The, the, the sidewalks aren't even. And, and at the time, we were singing um, Sanctuary, and, and then we went into Surely the Presence of the Lord is in this place. And so it was after that that they went back on, and I could hear him outside. He said, the sidewalks aren't even wet. It was just raining there. And I looked, and it was, there was, the rest of the prison was in deep, dark cloud. I mean, it was ominous. And uh, it was 15 minutes later when we left, and it was still raining. And when we got into the car, there was a beautiful rainbow just out of that section. And, uh, and it just struck me. That's the love of Jesus. There's no place too dark. There's no sin too great that he doesn't run to to forgive. So that's for you and for me. There's nothing that we can do that his love won't reach. But also, Jesus has that same love for those that we don't see as lovable, those that it's hard to love. You'll never lock eyes with anyone throughout your entire life that Jesus didn't pay the ultimate life to bring them to heaven, to forgive them of their sins, and to redeem their life. So let us be about that work. Let us share the love of Christ. Let us have those divine, let's pray for those divine appointments. God, would you bring somebody in my path that needs the love of Jesus this week, this day? And guess what? He'll do it. He'll do it. And then, Lord, make it really bright like a neon sign, and then do something inside of me to actually obey you, because uh, rely on his strength. So I don't know what the Lord is doing as we have our response song. Um, 
the altars are open. If you'd like prayer, uh, you can grab uh, myself or one of the other pastors or someone else uh, beside you to pray. Uh, yeah, maybe it's one of these legs that you need to work on, study or spirituality or Christian action. Let, let me pray with you. Jesus, thank you for your message of love and grace. It is greater than we could ever imagine. It's deeper, it's higher, it's, it's wider, it's longer. You're so beautiful. We love you today. Thank you that you're still in the work of redeeming people. And if there's anyone here today that hasn't accepted you as their Lord and Savior, may today be the day. Pray along with me. Jesus, forgive me of my sin. Jesus, be the leader of my life. I can't do it in my own. I need you. I need a Savior to rescue me from this, from this darkness in my heart. Jesus, would you bring your light in? And Lord, I don't know what the future holds, but I know you hold it, so I'm going to follow you. Jesus, may salvation come to my house today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.